Hi guys, welcome back to Hear Our Voices. I'm your host, Kay Did. Thank you for coming back to the episode one more time for this week. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing, the people who are sharing. And thank you for the people around the world who's actually listening to our content and going and following us on social media. So guys, the social media link will be down below. As you know, also we have a new segment called Hot Topics is, com- is coming up. So look out for those extra you know, content a month that we do right now. We're uploading four part six to seven contents a month, approximately around there. For sure, you'll be getting five um actual full episodes. The hot topics are smaller and it's basically more about policy and how you can be involved into advocacy. Because it's hard just to have one or two voices when you have a group of people really putting out the issues of homelessness in New York City. And soon, as if you get bigger, you know, we could do it around the country. But right now, we're only based in New York, but we do take stories from other places. So think about that if you want to tell your story. But the more voices we have on a certain situation, the better the outcome can be because we all can make a difference. I'm not saying that one person cannot make a difference, but when we're all collectively together on one thing, it has a bigger impact. So today, actually, I have a guest. Her name is Judith, and she'll tell you about a program that we actually have right now. As you know, before we talked about the Bridge Project and that's a crap, um, cash transfer program. So this is also a cash transfer program. Can you tell us more about the program that you I'm actually part of it too. So it's not like, you know, this is a <laughs> something out of the blue, but I'm actually part of this program. I've been working with Judith for a while on um, trying to help the homeless community in, as a whole. So yes. Hi, Thanks, Judith. Kadisha. I'm such a big fan of yours. You know, I have been for, wow, it's like five years we're working together now, right? Oh, yes. Thank you. We've traveled together to important conferences. I think uh, your insights, your contributions to the field, they're just so important. And I'm so glad mm-hmm. that you're bringing your voice out to so many people. It's just so important for you to do that, really. And I, I commend you on it. And I'm grateful to be here so thank you thank you thank you for coming on though but you you really you're a champion for our people like you really make sure you have our voices heard not only does people who are higher up who have like you know probably phds and things like that who probably been in the field longer than i have but you make sure that the people who are experienced in homelessness have a voice and make sure they're treated right and really you know so i really i love that what you do for us and our people yes i i've i've learned a lot of of that from you and the others that we work with, because I'll tell you, I've been doing research in homelessness and family homelessness since like the 1990s. And I don't think we did a very good job of listening for a long time. <laughs> right. And I put that on me and other researchers that we weren't doing that. Right. So the opportunity to do that now is just makes the work just so much better. It really, and, and makes the Indeed. solution so much more real. Yes. Uh, for sure. And, you know, when we were working with you and the other women we work with, and you told us, look, you know, people need money. This right. is the, if you, if you talk to families in shelter and you talk to them about why are they there? How did they become homeless? It's about money. Really, right. it's not about anything else. Right. And then the money is why they have housing problems or housing instability. And the money causes all kinds of other problems for their kids, for everything. So I think listening to you, was so important and really led us to where we are now with what we call the Growing Strong program that's about to launch. And you're a big part of that. Uh, And we really had to listen. The other thing you told us, and and we'll talk about this a little more about Growing Strong. The other thing you and the other advocates said to us, yeah, people need money. If you can give them money, that would be really helpful, but also give them some peer support. Find some other moms who have made it through the system or who are doing okay now or found their way and ask ask them to help the moms that you're working with because they're going to have the best advice. They're going to have the best right information. Um, and they're also, it, it feels like a closer support for them than like a caseworker or a social worker. So we took your advice on that too. So the Growing Strong program that we're about to launch um, will be in shelters in New York City for homeless families. It's a a research experiment. We're trying to show the government that this can work. And we will be giving 100 families uh, in shelter a pretty substantial amount of money every year, probably around $16,000, $17,000 a year in cash to help them, we hope, leave shelter sooner than they would otherwise. 
Um, and with that cash, they have an option to also engage with a, 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 a peer advocate. And the peer advocates are there, like I said before, to really support them. First of all, to support them and how can they use that money to get out of shelter and create a life in the community, right? How else right. do they want to use that money? And also any other things that they're concerned about. Maybe they think uh, one of their kids needs an assessment. Maybe they've had trouble finding doctors. Maybe they're, um, you know, they're not comfortable with their baby's care, things like that. So I think uh, the peer advocates are just going to be a great option. And look, to, to tell the government, you should hire peers more than like social workers or caseworkers because you know, they have that kind of personal knowledge and experience and people will engage with them, I think could be a really big win for you and other advocates and for the voices that we need to continue to hear. I think so. So uh, when the program gets off the ground, as I said, we'll be enrolling 100 families into the experiment where they get a lot of cash. There are going to be other shelters where we enroll families, but they get less money because we're trying to also show the government like how much money makes a difference, what how much will really help people get out of shelter sooner. Because the main thing we wanna do with this money is to show that you can shorten the length of time that families are in shelters. That's our number one. And the group that we really are interested in enrolling this are families that have very small children, like infants to two years old. The reason we're doing that is because historically, if you look at homeless families back to when the crisis started in the 80s, what you'll see is uh, the vast majority of families have very young children. Some of them have some older children too, but most families have young children. And actually there are many births that take place while families are homeless in shelter. A lot of people don't know that either. And for a long time, if you looked at the, the data across the US, what you would see by age for homeless people is that the most frequent age that someone was in a homeless shelter in the United States for a long time was an infant, zero to one. People think because you see older people on the streets who are homeless and you see older people in shelters and like that's the image that people have. But we know, right, Kadisha, that there are a lot of babies that are in homeless shelters. And we know from some other research that being homeless when you're a baby or when you're born is not a good thing. It, it changes your, uh, your baby's outcomes. What I mean by that is like their health, their stability, how they do, and how they do health-wise even for years to come. So we, we, we've decided, right, that that's an age group we're very interested in is small children. So the families we enroll will all have small children. Uh, and that's important. It's not that the other families don't matter. They are just as important. But we do know that since there are so many little kids in shelters and kids born into shelter and how it affects them the rest of their life, it's important to start there. So that's where we're starting. I think it's a good starting point. That's definitely wonderful. People might not know a lot of people are born in shelter. A lot of people stay longer in shelter than they need to actually stay in shelter because of this. This is not like we're pointing at the problem, but we're also giving a solution to a problem. A lot of times, you know, even on the podcast of time, we tell you about what's happening in shelter, what bad happened. Um, and we tell you how people come out of shelter, but we want to be able to boost people up to get out of shelter even faster. Because that's the real thing. We're happy that we have shelters because we didn't have shelters. People be just be a lot of people be more on the street, but we don't want them to stay there. On average, right now, people stay there over a year and change. We don't want that to happen. We would like that people get in and get out, get the help that they need and get out, and the money that they're given can be a solution to that problem. Um, yeah. money can't solve everything, but it can solve help solve this part of that problem. Right, and we'll be giving them that money for two years. So we hope that during the beginning of that two years, they'll find a way to use the money to leave shelter early. We hope most of them will also get a voucher, right? So they have continued help. This does not take the place of a voucher. And we helped to um, pass a law in New York State saying that if you do an experiment with cash like this, it won't affect your other benefits either. And so we are, are using that law to protect 
everyone who gets this cash is other benefits. So I'll give you an example, right? So if you get $15,000, $16,000 a year extra, it won't be counted towards your income. When they look at you for TANF, for voucher, for SNAP, for Medicaid, we can protect those things. So that's, that's you know, and and that's what we want to make sure of. We're, we're actually pausing a little before we start to make sure that's in place because we don't want to start without that. So when we do start, that will be that will be the case. It's like you said, uh, Kadisha, it's also about what happens when you leave shelter, right? So you you it's great. Yes, New York is a great place because we have a right to shelter that says uh, that if you really need it, you have a place to go. The problem is uh, it doesn't say you have a right to housing. So people wind up in shelter for a long time because the system is very geared towards providing shelter and not as geared towards really making sure people have housing or stay in their housing and don't lose it. So what we want to do is make sure that families have the cash for two years, even after they leave shelter, it's still two years from beginning to end. Uh, so they can get themselves like a really good, uh, strong community connection where they're going and feel secure about where they're living, buy some furniture, right? Feel good about yeah, themselves. Yeah. Get them kid, get their kids enrolled in programs in school, even and and make sure that they have the clothes and the toys and the books and things to keep up with the other kids. Like all of that. That that's really what that's for. Just to, you know, I I very much admire some of the other programs that are trying to do this around the country. None of them are doing the same like cash for families who are in shelter, but some of the other programs they put a very big emphasis on that the cash allows a mom to be the mom she wants to be because she doesn't have to worry or scrimp on things and not provide her kids with what she wants. She can take her kid to the aquarium if she wants to, because she has a little money to do that, right? A little extra money. There are lots of things I think that moms can't do that don't have enough money. And if you want to be the mom uh, that you think you can be, I think this cash will help. And that that's what a lot of these programs are emphasizing. I don't know what you think about that, Kadisha, but that that message was very strong to me. Have you heard that message? I feel like I've heard that message. I feel like I heard it a lot from our group. Um, I feel like I haven't looked as much into other programs in other states. I feel like I mostly stayed in New York City a lot, which I'm trying to get more out there in the, in the country and see what um, people have to offer. I've seen things here and there. Um, what I do like about this program is that we are making sure that other benefits are not taken away. A lot of times when people get extra things or extra money, if you don't know, um, when you have welfare, when you get a certain amount of money, even if it's not a lot of money, they take a lot from you. So to even do a job, he was like, I want to get a job. I want to have this kind of work and this kind of money coming in um, because you got to always weigh it out. You have to always think about if I do this job. Are they going to take away childcare? Are they going to take away the cash part? And you think maybe if when I add up how much I'm actually getting in and think about what welfare is actually giving me, which one weighs more? Especially mm -hmm. when you have a young baby, you need childcare. So it's like you have to think about what's going to be good for you and your family. And sometimes the job is not the best to have it. And it's like it's kind of sad that because you want to work, but it's just the job, you know, the job market, they don't pay enough, especially for New York City. So it's like when you add everything out, being on the welfare by itself without a job or having a, a, a small job, it actually, um, it comes out better. Um, example, I told us on the other podcast that I had a um, job um, opportunity for, it was, what's the light company? I forgot what it's called. It's over to eat. I'm, I'm going blank right now. Con Ed? But, con, yes, I had a job. What is it? Con Ed, yes. Con Ed. But the problem was is that the amount they was giving me and also me going so far into Queens. And at the time I lived in Brooklyn, and my baby was so young. I couldn't, when I think about the money for daycare and this and that, the money they were giving me was not enough to survive. So it made no sense to take the job, even though it was a good opportunity at the time. I have to, I have to wait, what's better? <laughs> getting Con Ed and not getting my proper child care or getting child care, probably being at home, get a lesser job money and think about it that way. So, or doing something off the books. That's what a lot of people have to end up doing to make sure their mm -hmm. benefits are staying on. And that's why I like when we were doing this program at this moment is that you could still get a, you could still get a voucher. You could still have your welfare and your, um, with your food stamps and your 
harm medical and all these things. These are very important things um, in life. You need to have, especially when you have a newborn baby or just a yeah. baby in a certain bracket, they need vaccines. People, some people don't take it, but I advise to take them um, because they keep you away from a lot of germs, especially if they're in daycare. Kids come with, if you don't know, they sneeze on you. And they sneeze in your mouth too. So you're getting sick while a baby is sick. It's a whole disaster waiting to happen. Um, if they get their vaccines, that's good. They get a regular checkup, that's good. It's, it might be something that's going on, going wrong with your baby. And you don't even know because you're not a doctor. That should be a new parent. You might not know, oh, maybe they should be walking at this time. Maybe they should be sitting up at this time. The doctor will ask you these questions. Yeah, you can look at a YouTube video. I'm not saying that's the wrong thing. If you don't have it, you don't have it. Things happen. But a doctor can tell you what muscles they need to be at, what things they should be doing. Um, yeah, they, they might just be eating at this certain time, certain kind of foods. And to be able to have, still have those services plus have this is an amazing opportunity. Also, having uh your your voucher, which is, you know, City Fabs for New York City, and they have soda, and they have oh, and many different things. One thing Judith didn't tell you is that if you move out of the state and get ready to start in this program, you can still stay in the program no matter what. Mm -hmm. So if you are, a, you know, you know, a higher income person and you have like a soda program if you don't know what soda program is for 12 months of rent and usually people are higher income usually take this and move out the state with it because to live in new york even though they're higher income not really but income mm -hmm. they can um live usually better in another state what has a lot like a lower um rate of living right so having this money and doing everything and having a deposit down example you go three four five months putting this money to the side, plus you have a voucher, that's an excellent little deposit to the side. If you have the one-shot deal, you have extra months ahead of you. Like, you can go six months without stressing. When I moved into NYCHA, I went about three. At first, they didn't pay my stuff on time. So, you know, HRA, they do pay things late. So, let's, let's be, I'm going to be realistic. But when they finally got everything together and I got the stuff from Catholic Charities, and this, I went about three, four, five months without paying rent because I just had things already set up for me that I, it came in. I got to just breathe for a little bit. Mind you, if you don't know, NYCHA is the projects in New York City, um, the housing authority, and they go by income. So already, I'm, they give you 30% of whatever you make, right? So I'm already paying lesser rent compared to most people, but I don't have to go a couple of months without paying for those things. It keep your mind at ease. Granted, I was sleeping on the floor. So if you're a person like me, this money would have been excellent because you could buy furniture. Can you imagine coming out of the shelter, which is already a horrible experience? Some people have better. You know, it could have been worse. I'm happy I wasn't sick on the street with my baby. But the shelter was very chaotic. You could tell people had some people had mental health problems. It was baby mama drama with people and, you know, whatever was going on. But coming to your place, you're so happy to be here. But you come in here, you're sleeping on the floor. I, w I felt bad I even had my daughter in the predicament of being homeless. But we came to our own place and was sleeping on the floor for a while before somebody gave me a bed. Somebody bought a new bed for me and my daughter. So having this extra income, you would have to feel ashamed of some people you're sleeping on the floor because why? You could at least save up a couple of months in advance and be able to buy these things for yourself. They do have programs like out there from HRA, takes forever. They're supposed to leave the shelter with a certain um, a housing voucher. It didn't happen for me. It's supposed to happen, but it didn't happen. I had to go to HRA myself and advocate as I do for myself. And Canva and Catholic Charities do give these things but it does take a long time if you already have the cash transfer thing coming in every month because we're paying people in every two weeks you put that money to the side and get you don't have to get the most fanciest at first the right when you first moving in you might not get the best things at first but you kind of save up over time and get the better things after a while but when you're first starting out especially you have kids you might not want the best things because they do tear things apart when they're younger so just be aware of that also so i really i appreciate this program i know families who get it will be like they'll be so happy about getting these things because it's just an opportunity that most people are not going to get. And I know people who are not going to get it going to be like, oh my gosh, I wish that was me. But hopefully when we put out the program for years to come that we could be able to incorporate more families to able to get this opportunity. And hopefully, honestly, the government could pick it up and have it to have a certain income bracket, even if you're not in shelter. That's what I'm always pushing for. I think we think about really the, the bottom bottom but people in the middle class are also struggling. They make more, but especially in New York City, we are struggling. So anything that could help families, not even families, there's people in general who are struggling. I think we should do that. But we're going to do it one day at a time, one program at a time. And right now, the population we are helping are mothers with children. As Judith also said, is that, um, example, if a mom has a baby, 
but they have other children or it could be the father. No matter how the dynamics is, Lona is the mom with a baby that we're working with. If they have other kids, she can buy something for her kids. She could buy school uniforms. She could buy school supplies. She could get her hair done. You know how it feels? Mm -hmm. Y'all see me. You know how it feels to get your hair done? You feel like a different woman. You feel like a different person. And when you're happy, your child is happy. Your child is better. Your child takes the energy of whatever you put out. If you're sad, your child probably is going to be sad. Even when you tell baby, I'm okay, your child could tell what you are when you're happy and when you're sad. So you get to take care of yourself, go out to the park, get outside to the park and get some ice cream. You know, ice cream back in the day was like a dollar. Now it's like two or three dollars for a little ice cream. So you have to probably skim if you wanted to. But to have these luxuries, and people don't think this as a luxury. People always think of vacations and no. Be able to eat ice cream with your kids in the park. That's a luxury because it's expensive. To do these small things, going to a skate park or going to a bouncy house place with your child, going to Barclay Center. These are luxuries. If you're really pro poor, 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 and broke, 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 you cannot get these things. So to be able to have extra money coming in, you could think about maybe next month, I could do at least one activity with my children. Mm -hmm. Family time is important. That helps your mental health for you and your kids. And sometimes we forget about the mental health for you and your kids, but that's important to make sure a family structure can stay together. So I am really excited about this program. I hope the families take full advantage of the peer support program and to really be able to make a difference for you know, people in, in their lives, you know? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up that they could spend money on getting their hair done. Because I have to tell you, there are some people who have said to us, even government people, you know, what if they use the money to get their nails in and their hair's done? And we say, that'd be great. <laughs> like, really? I mean, can you imagine how good they would feel? And, you know, this is, we're doing this as a, as a research, you know, to see what changes. And, and in that research, we're looking at mom's mental health, how kids are doing, how they're developing, things like that. Can you imagine, like, it could make those things so much better. I think you're absolutely right. And and even in the hardcore research, Kadisha, it shows that you're right, that when mom is feeling better, the kids do better, the families need time together to go experience things together, everybody does better. You're absolutely right. And it's not just that you feel it, it's actually in the research, you can see it's true. And so we are hoping that they're gonna use the money for those things, practical things too. What I say practical, like getting your hair done can be very practical also, but you know what I mean, like for other kinds of food or maybe to help <laughs> pay a better rent or add to the add to the daycare cost or whatever, you know, those things. But we do know, like there have been some other studies of how uh, people have gotten cash, people who are, are not wealthy at all, not even middle class, you know, uh, and and how they use it. People have studied that. How do they use extra cash? And the studies are so positive. They show how e even when they give cash to uh, people who have been living on the street, what they use the cash for. You know, there's this sort of weird attitude people have on their homeless. They're going to use it for out liquor or something, you know, to drink, whatever, you know, and it's just none of that's true. I mean, right. I never thought it was true, but now we have proof right? Right. that that's just not true. And people, I would say, especially moms and dads, they know what their family needs. And I think that families who are homeless uh, find themselves in a homeless shelter or, you know, experiencing a lot of like uh, income and money problems and things. They're right. very, very good at budgeting very good at budgeting, much better at budgeting than maybe like upper middle class or wealthier people because they have to be careful right. and they know how to spend their money to make best use of it. And I think that's what's going to happen with this money. I think people are going to use it to really make improvements for their family and their kids. It's so important. I'm going to ask you, because people want to know, how is a person, like they were in a shelter, like if you don't know, we have two for shelters, and um, how would a person be picked, and how do they have eligibility and requirement, is there an income requirement that you have to have, I know certain programs do have a certain cliff, like you have to be at before you can be in a program, yeah. but not be in a program. Well, we haven't announced where we're doing it yet, but it will be at certain shelters in New York City. And there are very few requirements to be eligible. 
if you have been found homeless by the city of New York. So you know there's a difference between when you go to shelter and then they tell you you've actually been found eligible for shelter. You know right. there can be like a time in between. Right. So we're not enrolling families in that like time in between. We're going to enroll families after they're told that they're actually eligible for shelter. So that's a requirement. They have to have been found eligible for shelter. They have to have been found eligible for shelter um, like in the past month or two. And that can't be too long. They can't have been in shelter for a year, for example, because then it's too hard for us to look at whether the money helps you leave shelter sooner. I don't know if that makes sense, but the it longer you're in shelter, the harder it is to change that. So we right. want to do it from the beginning. And the, the theory that our idea is that you would do this from the beginning or close to the beginning of right. a shelter stay. They have to have a child with them under the age of two. They can have other children also. It doesn't have to be mom, head of household. It could be dad, head of household. It could be grandma, head of household. That's okay. There aren't that many real requirements. Uh, but we're only going, it's going, we're only going to enroll a hundred families. So we're going to do it pretty quickly. And we're not announcing, you know, where we're doing this at this time. And it'll go, it'll go pretty quick, the hundred families. But you know, the real hope, as you keep saying too, Kadisha, is that we can show government that if you do something like this, you can help families get out of shelter faster. Saves the government a lot of money. Right. They're spending what ninety, a hundred thousand dollars a year on shelter for families, exactly. which is way more than rent. I mean, right. that's way more than rent. <laughs> right. Way more than what we're giving them. If you can get help them leave shelter earlier, they'll save money and they'll free up space in the shelters for other people. Right. Exactly. So, so that's that. The intent of this is to say, look, what families need is for you to give them the money so they can make the choices themselves. They're very good at making choices. Moms, dads, they know what to do. They know how to keep their family safe, comfortable, stable, but they don't have the money. So give them this money. Let's see if it works. If it works, then you should consider, instead of you know people being in shelter longer, giving families some money to help them leave sooner and help let them keep the money for a while so they can stay stable in the community. That, that's what we're doing. But it will only be 100 families. That's a very small number. It is. It really is. It's enough for us to be able to do the research to show the government that it works, but right. it's, it's a small number. And I think, yes, I think a lot of people are going to be disappointed, maybe unhappy that they're not going to get it. But we've got to move the system along, Kadisha. We right. have to. We've got to find new solutions. This is not working. Right. They're building shelters every day. This is not the way to do it. And that's what concerns me most. Why is it getting bigger and bigger, the shelter system? We got to find a way to make it smaller and smaller, right? right. So it's not going to be everyone. It, right, that's true. I feel bad in a way because I feel like I, the government knows for sure that cash works because we could see from in Corona that people were getting money. I think most of them was probably just families, to be honest. No, it was families because you had to have a child under the child tax years. credit. Yeah, the child tax credit was fantastic. And it wasn't even that much it, compared to the money the people in the shelter are getting. It wasn't even that much money, but they said a lot of kids got out of poverty. At yes. That time. So yes. This, this is what I don't understand. They see the research. They see what happened. They see how people got out of debt. And at the end of the day, we all have to live here, so the money technically going back into the economy anyway. We have to pay for rent. You gotta pay for food, mm -hmm. you gotta pay for light, you gotta pay for water. You have to wear clothes, you have to buy all these things. I don't know what the problem is of just giving the people the money who needs the money and and then making them just put it back into the economy. But it's like we're showing you every time that having cash works and you're not even listening to what we're saying. That's my fear though. Like I know this is gonna help so many people, but I wanna make sure that yeah. who do we have to scream at to say, just do the right thing. Give the people the money because they need the money to survive. When people don't have money, they go on the stressors and it makes things worse. The economy is worse and people's mental health are worse. So outside crime rates get worse. And I don't know if they want the crime to happen, but we see what's happening in New York City. Crime rate is crime rating. It's right. It's not good. Everybody is going, 
it was a lot. Corona itself was a um, disaster, as you know. If you lived through it and listening to this, um, it was a lot on people, households, people in DV situations, things like that. But people need money at the end of the day. People don't need you to watch what they're doing with the money. They really don't need that. Because, example, landlords, especially in New York, I don't know just everywhere, but a lot of landlords here, even though it's discrimination, hate vouchers. They really mm -hmm. hate vouchers. They don't want to take vouchers. They prefer work with a person who has cash because it's not a lot of tape to go through. If you don't know the CityFX voucher, you got to fill out this big old packet. We try to make it easy. I think it's either online or soon going to be online, something like that. Um, it's a whole thing. If you get one thing wrong, they, they bounce it back to you. People got to fill it out here and there and everywhere. Um, I'll actually put down, but not me, but my, my staff will help me. Um, not my staff, my my group. <laughs> not saying like that. Um, we'll put down the information down below of somebody who can actually help you if you have a city five voucher. And um, having all these things is just, it's a lot. It's a lot. The landlord does not like to use these. They they do Section 8 a little bit better, but they don't have a stigma, to, stigma with people who are on Section 8. But when you have cash, cold cash, a landlord would like to work with you better because city. if we don't know, the city don't pay their rent on time. They don't pay Nitro on time. They don't pay city FEPS on time. They don't pay um the child care on time. A lot of daycare centers are closing because the city don't pay their AC, ACS stuff on time or the HRA stuff on time. So when people don't pay things on time, people say, oh my God, these big corporations, sometimes it's a lot of mom and pop, you know, um, buildings people are living in or houses people are living in. And if they don't have the money, they have to sell or they have to kick people out. So people don't want to do it. But if, if a person cannot pay, if you have something broken in your apartment, but they're not getting rent for months, where are they getting the money out of blue air unless they have a job outside of that income coming in? You got to be reasonable, I think, in certain ways. I think a lot of times we try to blame, oh, landlords, landlords, this and landlords, that. But we got to really think about um, if the landlord could pay for something if something is broken if you're not paying the rent. Some people, that's their only source of income. Imagine a grandma who's 70, 80 years old who worked all her life to get this house but put you in the house because she wants extra income coming in but can't afford to keep any, you together in the house because why? The city's not paying the rent. We have to be reasonable. So a lot of landlords, even though discrimination and they can get in trouble for it, they take the chance because they don't like working with people with vouchers. So I think having a cash assistance program um, where people are not, not looking where they're putting the money in, say they're hiding it or using it this way or things like that, I think is a better deal just because it works. We see that it works better. People like cash, that's just in general. People love cash. And I think that's a way that we need to, I think it will happen eventually, to be honest, um, more mm -hmm. programs like this. And we can see from other states, as Judith said, are doing programs like this and see how they work and stuff like that. We work with a certain type of population, so it's much different. But um, we need to give the people the cash and we can help us stimulate the economy on top of it. So it's not like this is going to be in a bank saving up. When people are in a certain income bracket, a lot of times they don't have a lot of savings anyway because they have so much bills. They're living paycheck to paycheck. So I promise you, that money's not staying in the bank for long. As it gets in there, it's going right back out to Uncle Sam. So if you hear me, government <laughs> well yeah but I, I would say kadisha it's yes. also a good idea for people to have some savings right that's true that is a very good idea yeah. and if you can have some savings that puts you in a different position in your life that's true completely you know and the ability to have you know if if someone were in this in this program and and they saved like four or five thousand dollars it's good to have that money in the bank that's true it, it, you, you know, we're we sometimes forget that people need to have some savings. They shouldn't just live on the edge all every day. That's true. You know, and I I would hope that some people in this will save some money too for a rainy day or for something else. Or or learn that if they save, you know, start to learn about saving money, maybe they never did in their life. And right. if they start to save money, they can, you know, do something else with it someday. So I think I, I think that's important also. But you know, there are a lot of programs like let's just take food stamps or SNAP, right? Right. You know, it costs a lot of money for them to run that program, SNAP. It does. And it's it feels to me like if they just gave you the money to buy the food right. instead of like a card or have to, you know, we think that uh 
people would buy the food they need for the most part. You know, it's always going to be people who use it for something else. I, I totally understand that, but it's not anywhere near a lot. Right. It's never a lot of people, you know, and, you know, people say, wow, they could use it for alcohol or something else. There's many people who use alcohol that are poor that are really, really rich. So what's the difference? Right. I don't know. I mean, you say we want people to have free choice and freedom, but so you know, if things like SNAP could start to be considered, like let's the, maybe they could do an experiment, and just give people the cash and then say, see how they're eating. And maybe they're just eating better and it's easier and it's less stigma, right? Yeah. Less like doesn't show up when you go to the store that you're using the card, right. you know, that kind of thing. I mean, there are things we could really think about once we make more and more people comfortable with the idea of cash. And that's part of this, right? Just how yes. do we get people comfortable with it? You know, that, yeah, wealthy people have a lot of cash. Well, other people should have cash too. Right. So, so I think true. it's like comfort, you know? Yes. For a person who used to have be a welfare card holder, when I first got welfare, I did not like having a card. I was like, I was so honestly embarrassed just to swipe it, but I know it was money that I needed to use for food. So I just had to kind of swipe it. I didn't like, I had a cash portion. You could go to the bank to take it out. Or you could go in the stores and do like a whole thing to like pay for stuff with the cash. I preferred always to take the money out of the account, especially because most stores don't take, like if I'm going to buy clothes or something or diapers, well, if, unless you're in Target, but like certain stores don't take the cash part of the card out. So you have to go to the bank anyway. But I preferred mostly to take the money out and use it that way because it's embarrassing. Like now, I think after using it for, I had I was on it for over ten years at this point. Um, after a while, you just kind of like whatever food stamp card. Um, now I wish I could get a food stamp card. I, I don't even qualify anymore. Um, they say I make too much allegedly. So you know, um, so it does when you first, especially when you're first on a program, you're just kind of doing what you have to do to get by and the things like that. So I think having a different way about it would be definitely great. Yeah. 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 The way we're going to do the cash is that the right. families will get a card, but it looks like a MasterCard or a Visa, like debit card, just looks right. like a like a regular debit card. And they can go to ATMs. There's thousands of ATMs they can use to just take the money out if they want cash, like in their hand cash. They can just use it wherever they want to use it. They can buy things online. They can do whatever they want with the money and it gets refilled automatically. Every month they get a certain amount of money every single month for two years and they can do what they want with it. Like I said, they could take the cash out and put it in a savings account. They could take the cash out and pay a babysitter. They could, you know, whatever they want to do with it. I think that it gives them a lot of flexibility and it's not a government card. <laughs> it doesn't look like a government card, <laughs> you know, just looks like a card anybody would carry. You know, and it has all the same, like, you know, a pin number and protections for like, if you lose it or, you know, that any other card would have that anybody could have. So I think um, that there are a lot of advantages, you know, to that for, for a person, right. To have right. something that looks like what everyone else has. I don't know why they should have something different. Exactly. So I was thinking about the pair program. That's another part of this is intertwining into it. Um, because yes. you're talking about savings accounts and stuff like that. I mean, well, savings, not well, technically a savings account, right? And that's one of the things we're going to be doing in the pair program. But I'm not going to be doing it. But um, I'll be seeing people who are going to be doing it and how the pair pro program, you could tell them more about the pair program and what programs they might be having for people in the family. For family yeah. Culture. So I talked a little bit about how the peers are going to be really prepared to help with like making sure your paperwork, everything's ready to get a voucher so you can get your voucher. Um, they're going to be prepared to help with, um, you know, in any way they can supporting mom with like looking at apartments, finding an apartment, you know, moving out, even thinking about like, is there someone maybe that, um, she could move in with and help pay the rent for a while while she finds a way to use her voucher or things like that. There's, yeah. so the peers will really be like one of their main focuses on how do we help you and your young child and other kids, if you have them get out of shelter. Right. So that's one focus. Another area of focus, you're absolutely right, has to do with financial. Right. So none of this is mandatory. Right. So you can decide you want to help get your peer to help you with this or not. But the peers are going to offer 
that they can um, work with you and someone in like a financial planning group at another organization that we're working with where you can go there for free and you can get advice and they can like map out how you want to use your money, talk to you about savings, talk to you about, uh, you know, sort of how you want to budget this money because it's a lot of money that you're getting on top, you know, all of a sudden in a way. Right. Um, and, and really like, and talk to you if you've never had maybe a, a, a bank account, getting a bank account, maybe, and things like that. So, uh, there is a financial component to it, but it's completely volu like voluntary. Like you can do it or not do it. We think a lot of the families will want to, because we think they're going to want to make the most of the money. You only get this for two years, make the most right. of it. That's sort of the saying, right? Right. <laughs> you know, like, uh, you know, it, 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 so um, so that's absolutely a part of it. Another part of it, because all of the families will have at least one child under the age of two, is to help support them in things that mom might want to do for their young child or baby. You know, are they, uh, do they want to get more help, let's say, for example, with nursing their child? Um, how can they find the right, you know, some doctors for, for their kids? Uh, if they if they think their kid might have some like developmental problems, you were talking before, Kadisha, about how, you know, is there somebody who can say, well, they're one and a half, they should be walking. They'll be able to do that and say, if you're concerned, mom, about that, um, let's let's go together and find you the right people to go and talk to. And so they'll be able to do that. You know, the goal is to support mom and the things or I say mom, but we could be dad. Right but to support them in the things they want for their family. And right. from their life experience as someone who was homeless with their children and is now stable in the community and has this great job as a peer advocate, how can they help this family and support them on the things the family wants help with, right? You know, maybe mom has been really depressed for a long time and she hasn't confided in anybody. Maybe the peer, Somebody who was in her place is someone she'll confide in. And the peer will have the knowledge of, okay, if you really want to get some help, I've got some ideas. I know a place that other moms have gone to. Let, let's make an appointment. Maybe I'll go with you the first time. And then you go on your own. Those kinds of things. It's very important. But it has to be really around what mom wants for herself and her family. It's not what the peer advocate wants, but their advocates there to advocate, right? If you're trying to get an appointment and you're not getting that appointment and you want to go over and see if you, the peer will go with you. They'll right. go with you. Let's get that appointment, right? right. I'm going with you. Or I, I went through that and here's what I did. Right. And look, I'm not the right person to do that. <laughs> But I, but someone like yourself, Kadisha, right? right? Somebody who had to go through it, who understands um, on a very, very personal level is, is I think going to be very, very effective and helpful. And we'll be tracking what it is that they actually wind up doing with, with the families right. um, and what the families feel is valuable. So that we know, like, and we may have to make some adjustments. Maybe the families think something we're offering is not so valuable and no one's using it. So we'll make some, we'll find out what is valuable. What would you like? You know, we can do that. What I like about Pair Advocate, like, I think it's a very good program to have. Just because we have a person who was in your shoes and they are coming with training and they come with things like that. And they can really give you practical things because the system is said on paper, one thing when it's actually done and implemented is a totally, not all the time, but a lot of times it is in a totally different way. You can go to get to a solution without doing certain things. And it's like, why would I do that? Because when I did that before, it did not work. And things are constantly, if you don't know, they're constantly, stuff is changing in the homeless world, in City Pep's world. So the, the pairs will be up to date on what's happening as much as we can be um, up to date on those things to make sure we're giving the people the right information. Sometimes caseworkers in shelters are overwhelmed. They have a lot of people. And because we are only having 100 people, it's not as much as when the caseworkers have all these people going in and out of shelter, keep up with this thing. We have a smaller caseload compared to a regular caseworker, well, supposed to anyway. Um, you know, people are overworked and underpaid at this point in shelters. But um, having this one-on-one -on -one 
plus they have the casework at the shelter, plus they have hopefully a housing specialist. They have other things. So honestly, having a peer is never going to be a negative. It's always going to be a positive. It's going to be a, another person on your team that you can go. It's like a tool belt. You take out, you need this person for this person, this person for this person, and now the peers be able to help you on your one-on-one -on -one needs. They have, we're going to be doing, well, not we, they're going to be doing groups and things like that um, with other people, other residents in the shelter. They're going to be having one-on-ones and things like that. So if you want to talk privately with your person, you'll be doing that. So it's really to be able to help the families as much as they can to get to know the families and really have a relationship with families. Because sometimes yeah. when you just, yes. So I, when, I was just going to say, also, let's not forget, they have the peer if they want to for two years. So right. if they leave shelter after six months or eight months and they're in the community, the peer is with them. Right. So, you know, a tough time for a lot of people, and you were talking about this before, and a lot of people don't know this, Kadisha, is a tough time can be when you move from shelter into your new place. Right. First of all, all very often it's a neighborhood where you don't really know anybody. That's you true. don't know your way around. You don't know where the bodega is. You don't know where the grocery store is. You don't know right where to buy diapers, all these kinds of things, right? You don't know where there's maybe a really good clinic for your baby. So moving to a new place can be really you know, stressful. It can be complicated. And I think, you know, having a peer that sort of with you on this journey could be, you know, who went through that really, really helpful. I mean, I know for myself, when we moved with our two kids, every time we moved, we got a lot of help from all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. you, you need, it's not easy moving from one place to another, right. especially with children. So, right. so let's not forget that they have that peer for two years if they want. So, you know, they're already living in their new place for six months and they think, wow, I'm really struggling with something here. You know, I'm really struggling to, to, you know, make friends and be part of my neighborhood. And, you know, maybe the peer has some advice. I'm going to give them a call, right? And maybe the peer says, listen, did, have you ever been interested in like a church or some other community group? Let's go find one, you know, right. connect you. So I think, yeah, there are all these important things that happen in your life. When you move with a small child or a baby, you've done this, Kadisha. Not easy. It's not. <laughs> It's not Ment mentally, emotionally, physically. Mm -hmm. None of that's easy. Right. You could use the support, right? It's true. Someone to advocate for you and for what you're looking for. Yeah. Two years is maybe not even enough, but we, that's what we're doing. And we think it'll, we think it'll be helpful. So I think it's also good because sometimes caseworkers talk to so many different people. So they might leave us some information. If you have a person who's personal to you, you'll be able to get information from them. And also, I think a lot of times in shelter, that, well, honestly, all the times in shelter, when people leave, they kind of just forgot about. They're, they're basically numbers, not even a person. They're not thought about after they left because they're technically their job is done. They got you out of shelter, it's boom. Mm -hmm. A peer can help, help you with aftercare. Aftercare is a very important part because you can go about three to six months of really getting acquainted with the area that you live in the thoughts that you have in your head, I finally made it out, but like, what's next? We had all these dreams when you're in shelter, what I did anyway, of what's going to be happening. I'm going to be cooking. Mind you, I hate to cook, but I was like, I'm going to be cooking this and this because the shelter I was living in, if you don't know, they only had a microwave and I hate microwave food. I didn't grow up like that. Um, They didn't have a stove. Now they have stoves in there, apparently, from what I heard. Um, But I had all these dreams, like I'm going to be in my sofa. When I, and granted, when I just moved in, I couldn't afford a sofa, but I was like, I'm gonna be my sofa cooking food to watch TV. And it's like, when you actually get it, it's like, I don't actually have money for furniture. I gotta think about, you gotta think about curtains, brooms. When you come in, you just don't just land your people, maybe somebody does, I don't know. You just land in your apartment. No, you clean you clean the place with a little bleach first. And you gotta think about all these things. It's like, oh my gosh, where is the supermarket? Where is it, and where was the best one? Because it might be a couple around you, but where's the cheapest one? Where's the mm -hmm. best one we could find? And some supermarkets, they might have this item, but I one have this one. Or like a Korean spot, because they usually have like more sometimes the fresher stuff, things like that. Like it could be a real person to be almost, to me, what I think of a pair, not just a person who's helping you, but a friend. A friend was kind of assigned and getting paid to do it, but a friend nevertheless, you can call almost at any time. I believe that like almost a 24-hour thing that we're going to have. Um, 
it's basically sometimes in shelter, I tell people, keep your head down. Don't talk to much people because when you talk to a lot of people, I feel like it, some people have a drama and some shelters are more dramatic than others. And when you have a pair, you know that person's assigned to you. You could call on them. If you're feeling sad or depressed, you could talk to that person. If you listen to the other episode, by the time this come out, that um, postpartum one should be out already about baby blues and having postpartum. You might not even realize they're having it, but mm-hmm. the pair would be like, mm, or maybe you have to talk. You have somebody to talk to them. Maybe they could rec- recommend something to you if they feel like, I don't feel like you should be, I think you should be happy. I should, like Having a baby is joyful, but when you're in a crisis, it makes it worse on your mental state. So you end up going in postpartum without even realizing or even want to go in that position. And who wants to be in postpartum? But it just, it happens to you. You can have, as you saw in the other, heard in the other episode, you can have four babies and be postpartum on the fifth child. And it's just one thing can, lead, one stressor can lead you to a certain direction. So um, having a peer, I think is excellent because it helps a person now, especially in aftercare. It just, Trust me, if you haven't been homeless and if you're homeless now and going to get out, going into your new place, it's, it's happy. Trust and believe. But when everything settles <laughs> and your mind has time to think, like, I'm out of here and this is mine, you're like, what's next? I, I think you're funny, Kadisha. Yeah. You're sort of funny because you're talking about how you dream, like, oh, you sit on your couch and you'll cook. But instead, you are leading and running an incredibly effective advocacy organization. <laughs> Thank you. Which was not in your dream. It wasn't. It wasn't. But you're so funny because like you are not sitting on that couch. (laughs) You are out there trying to make big change, you know, which I think is uh, to me, it's just funny to hear you say that what your dream was, because like, I'm glad you didn't take that dream. Like, (laughs) sit on. you wouldn't be doing this, right? Definitely true. That is definitely true. It's it can make a difference in people's lives. I'm just so ha- I'm excited for the families. I know the families who are going to get this um money is going to be excited that they have it. I have another question because I also I want to make sure people know do the people have to be because a lot if you don't know New York City have a lot of migrants who's coming in and they keep coming in. Which New York City always had this thing going on because Ellis Island we're just a hub of a melting pot of people. But now it's just bigger than before. Right? But we're, we're going along. We're going to do as New York does and help what we have to help and be who we have to be. But people, um, you know, they have they have a certain migrant shelters, but they also have people coming in from the DHS and PATH to go to regular shelter. Are people like that going to be able to also join into this program? Uh, our goal is to take a few families right. who are in some way undocumented Right. or newcomers. Um, I'm not exactly sure we'll achieve that at this point, but our goal is to take a few because we also want to see what happens with them if you give them cash, because in other ways, the government also spends a lot of money, um, you know, on on programs and, and things for them too. So we want to see like, you know, what does this do? And um you know, there are some who come in and who without too much trouble can get like a work permit too. Right. So it may be the combination of a work permit and some cash for a little while, like two years could maybe really get them on their way. Right. So we'd like to include a few to see if that, if that could be the case. Um, we don't, we're not a hundred percent sure right now, but we would like to do that. I think it's important that we do that. And again, it sort of would relieve stress on the system because if that means that those families leave the shelter faster, right? it sort of, again, it makes it so there's more space available. Maybe we don't have to build so many shelters. You know, we can sort of turn things around. We have to find ways to make that happen too. So it's like these, as you said before, like these other policy questions, right? right. Can you move the government in a direction by showing them something works? So we'd like to. I'm not 100% sure we'll be able to do it at this point. I understand. I understand. So the shelter is just, if you don't know, guys, shelter can be overwhelming. And I'm just so happy that this program is happening. I just feel like, I can, honestly, I wish, I'm happy I'm not in shelter right now, but I wish I had a program like this for myself. I would have done so much more better i would have got a shelter much faster to be honest um if you don't know my story if you're first time hearing this i didn't qualify for city faps i wasn't eligible for city faps um at the time they had link they had different link programs the link ended up going to city faps 
and um, I tried to get into Link. And the person who was my casework, my housing specialist, wasn't doing her job, so that's a different story. But I wish I had this opportunity to have this. I wish I had programs like this to really helping our families and making a difference and making us like a solution families. Because honestly, being homeless is really is depressing. Yeah. I don't know anybody who could be a state of shelter and be happy all the time. Maybe it's a person like that. It's always an exception to the rule. But you really, especially when you're a new mom like myself, and I, you know, I'm a single mom. At this time, I was married. Um, but you know, going through the breakup and everything while I'm in shelter, it can be a lot on a person. It can be a lot on your mental health. And um, making sure you always check on your mental health, guys, because it could take, it could bring you down lower than you ever thought you could do. Um, so. I'm just happy that people will be able to take advantage of this and really change their lives because one thing can make your whole life turn in a whole different direction. And I'm just so, I'm, I feel lucky for that. I wish, I just wish it was me, but I'm happy at this point to be able to advocate for people like this and to be able to do other programs like this in shelter, the shelter world and to be able to be an advocate, like, to be honest, um, because of the situation I went through, I do advocate for people and their situations. I advocate for families. I advocate for children. I advocate for you. I, I advocate for veterans. I don't care what homeless part you are. I know some people are more biased and like, wherever they are, they stand. And I was, as you know, I was um, couch surfing for a while before I even got into the shelter because they denied me numerous times, which is ridiculous in by itself. But um, I don't care what part of homelessness you are. And I want everybody to win. Everybody needs a place to stay. Um, these are things that they tell you in school when you're a child. You need, you need water, you need food, you need shelter, you need clothing. These are things that they say we need basic things. But a lot of people don't have the basic things. And you can't survive properly without the basic things. So we can be able to give people cash to able to help them to be able to get and achieve these basic things. People, I, I tell people all the time, we're not asking for the Taj Mahal of things. But asking for a basic, basic home for somebody to put their head in and to be okay with. Homelessness needs to be, I know it's, it's hard for New York City. Because we, I feel like we don't have a lot of room for a lot of things. But it needs to be eradicated at this point. And it, it doesn't need to be here. Being homeless is not, it's not something people want to be. It's just sometimes, a lot of times it just happens to them. Um, And before people even go to a shelter or on the street, they have months and months and months of thinking of, and problems and disasters and things like that happens to them before they even get to that point. Nobody comes up like, oh, all of a sudden, like, I'm having a good job, go homeless. It's, it's never like that. Majority of the time, it's either it could be a natural disaster, it could be a fire, it could be a flood. Um, it could be an eviction, you're fighting for your home for months. It could be that a child um, turns 18 and they're forced to child and their parent was like, oh, I did my job already, you're out of the house. A person could be homeless for many, many different reasons. We have to sit here. We have to listen why that became like that. And even if it is their fault, okay, things happen. Nobody's perfect. It doesn't matter whether it's their fault or not. The point is that people are out here who need homes. And people are out here who need love. People are yeah. out here who need cash. And we need to be the people to stand up for them and be a voice for these people to make sure that the world can be better. How can start yeah. the world? The people We try to start the world a lot. The U.S. can be better. New York City can be better. And when the system is working better, everything else works better. When we have less homeless, everything is, I'm telling you, it's gonna be better. There's no way we can just have no homeless people and just like have all these, you know, and nothing, no. It makes the economy better. It makes people's lives better. People will be off the street with mental health better. And granted, not everybody on the street has mental health, so don't come for that. But you know, some people are on the street who does have mental health. And if we can help those people, get on meds or do what they need to do or you'd be surprised if we could help the population of homelessness in general i know this podcast is for families only basically right but i stand for anybody who's homeless who doesn't have a home who can i call a place their home yeah I want you us know, a to lot be of, there are a lot of people who are homeless on the street that were homeless when when they were a child right so we've got to find a way to like stop this right but i i just just want to summarize for just a second, Kadisha. Right. You know, the two main things that I think that we're trying to prove with Growing Strong are number one, there are ways to help families 
get themselves up and out of shelter significantly faster. And we think cash is one of those. Right. The other one is that we have to always be thinking about a word you said before, what you need to survive. Because what we really want is people to move from surviving to thriving. Yes. And their family and kids. Kids are always concerned about the kids, right? Right. You don't want your kids to be in survival with you. You want them to be thriving. So these are the two, I think, most important things that we want to do with Growing Strong. For sure. But guys, I hope you learned so much. I hope that anybody who's listening to this, you are a lucky winner of the golden ticket of Growing Strong. Because I know it will make an amazing impact in your life, in your children's lives, in your family's lives. I hope that you guys, who, anybody who's listening, who's in policy, and who would think this is a great program to put up and have it on for a longevity amount of time, I implore you to put it on for families and for people who need the help, who are homeless and doesn't mm-hmm. just need a leg up. They're not asking for too much. Just it's only two years, you know. Um, a lot can happen in two years, and you can see from the past couple of years, time goes very fast. Anyway, um, we hope that you can pick up the program and really make a difference in somebody's life and be on the right side, right side of history. Thank you for listening, guys. Thank you for being amazing. Follow us on social media. I hope this helps somebody, and I hope that you can get all the answers that you need. And talk to you next time, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Khadija.